finally getting to a Yakuza game. I've been a fan of this series since getting Yakuza 4 on the PS3. The game was on sale for $20 at the time and I pretty much liked the world of Kamurocho once I was able to play as Akiyama. I plan on getting every Yakuza or like a Dragon Platinum trophy. Ideally, I would have loved to get them in their release orders, but I don't have all the games right now, so I'll just have to get all of them out of order starting with Yakuza Kiwami. All the Yakuza games have a completion list and for most of the games, I'll have to complete every single thing on the list in order to get the platinum trophy. The adventure list isn't too hard, it's more of a grind which would be the ongoing trend for most of the games, having to do a certain thing you would normally do but not just do it a bunch of times like talking to 300 people. You can talk to the same person over and over again so I just kept pressing X on a random person I chose to speak to 300 times. Eating at all restaurants and dining at them 100 times is self-explanatory. It's better if you have a lot of money to just spend and go to every single restaurant to eat the entire menu and then repeat until you have all of them. Same thing with eating 30 food and medicine items. Once I had all the money to spend, I got a bunch of toughness Z, stamina X, ramen, and water. Taking a taxi 30 times is a really good way to get around the city if you don't want to waste time walking or running on foot. And then traveling on foot by dashing or walking normally is also needed. This should come naturally as long as you look around Kamurocho. I didn't want to actively do this during premium adventure mode and doing laps around the city. So I always had these two in the back of my head just to walk around areas that I wouldn't normally have been there but there might be an item there. Earning 10 million yen is easy through a method that I'll get to later on. Opening coin lockers is easy using a guide or having the locker radar which makes a sound if I was near a locker key. I never used this because it was easier to use a guide to show and tell me where exactly the key was. And entertaining yourself 100 times comes from mostly the mini games. The battle list is about defeating enemies in the different styles, the Colosseum, and weapons. 200 enemies for each of the styles. Brawler is sort of the default style. It's not great nor is it bad. It's a good style to start with and depending on your taste, you could stick with it or move on to the others. I stuck with it because it didn't have any big drawbacks to it. Rush style is more of what I like. It's super fast and I was able to dodge mid combo if I saw an enemy about to hit me. And it's super cheap if you know how to use it right. B style is not really my thing mainly because it's super slow. I've seen speedruns of Kiwami and Zero and B style pretty much dominated a good amount of the run because of how powerful it can be by hitting harder and it covers a wider range of attacks along with automatically picking up a weapon whenever you start attacking. So while there's a good amount of benefits to using this style, the slow part is what kills it for me. Sort of have to commit once you start attacking. And then Dragon style. I didn't use a whole lot because it sucked early on. I had to beat Majima for a good amount of the moves and learn all the Komaki moves which the only reason to do so was Tiger Drop, arguably the most powerful and OP move in all the games. But even after getting this, I don't really use Dragon Style. The only time I used it was during the boss fights in Majima, and the only move that I would use was, of course, Tiger Drop. There are other moves to use, but Tiger Drop just makes everything better. Since I needed to defeat 200 enemies for each style, defeating 500 enemies and helping 30 people around the city both came naturally, as well as defeating 10 Nuvo and 1 Kiwami enemy. The Nuvo enemies are are wearing gold and they don't spawn in too often so if I saw one then I would drop whatever I was doing and go fight them. Same thing for the Kiwami guy who luckily I just got when I was farming enemies. Breaking and defeating 100 enemies with objects or weapons was sort of the only one I had to actively go out and do. At no point in the game I thought of picking up a weapon, using brawler and rush style was enough for me. Getting 100 weapons and 70 gear items wasn't an issue. A lot of it is tied to sub stories and a good amount of them can be bought from the pawn shops or other shops that only sell weapons and gear. Using 300 heat actions and 40 different types of heat actions I got when I was using each style. Most of my fights already ended in a heat move even if it was a waste. I still use the heat move because it was cool to always use one. 
The Colosseum is an underground tournament where you partake in fights. It gets introduced in chapter 5 and the list wants me to win 50 fights and fight all 25 opponents. The Colosseum doesn't do much for me, it's more fighting and that's really it. It gets repetitive real fast and by the time I got around 20 wins, I was getting bored. But this is one of the better ways of earning a lot of money. The other way is getting the Ibusu socks and you earn money by walking around the city. I didn't want to spend hours or even more running around to get a million or so yen. So the Colosseum is the other way. Having a lot of money just helps out a lot. I can spend without having to worry about how much I'm spending. So I won't be talking about every single sub story because some of them I thought were okay or I just have nothing to say about them and I'm only going to talk about the ones I like. The price of an F cup is a scam sub story where Kiryu helps a woman and after helping her, she offers you to go to a bar for a drink and while I initially said yes, the more she was persistent in having me drink, I was more suspicious of her and the bartender and I said no every time it was offered. The bartender gets fed up and I have to beat him up in his guise and then he gives us access to the secret casino at the ramen place. This isn't the only sub story involving a scam. There is the molestation one, palm reader, debt collection, bump and scam, and there's three or four sub stories dedicated to just bumping into the same people and doing the same trick. There's one about contacts, the brother and sister scam. There's too many of them. And the reason why I only liked the first one was because Kiryu was doing a nice thing, which turned out to be a scam and it led to the casino. The others were obviously a scam and there was no swerve at the beginning. Haruka recognizes a boxer as she's a boxing fan. The boxer is Jako Yagisawa. He doesn't treat Haruka that well, which means I gotta beat him up and then ask him why he's in a bad mood. Turns out he has to throw his championship match, the one he's been fighting for, and he's told to throw it because he messed up a Yakuza member and the news made it to people who can make his life worse. So Kiryu decides to help him out and beat up the guy who wants him to throw that match. And now Jako can win the fight without having to worry about any sort of consequences. Doing this made Haruka happy, even though she heard about throwing the match she still wanted to believe that he would win so it meant a lot to her that I used violence to solve the issue. The accuser's wife is short but significant. Kiryu goes back to the beginning of the game where he took the blame and meets Yayoi Dojima who wants revenge and has a group try to kill him but it doesn't work. Yayoi suspects that Kiryu isn't the actual killer and wants to know who he's trying to protect and Kiryu still protects Nishiki and asks Yayoi for a bit of time. Even though it seems that Nishiki is a completely different person, Kiryu still wants to believe that he did the right thing taking the blame and at the end, she drops down and cries. She's waited 10 years to find her husband's murder and just wants closure closure on the situation. A doctor's duty has Kiryu meeting a boy who is all alone and wants food because he's hungry. Kiryu meets the same boy again and asks for food again. And the boy is always alone because he's waiting for his mom who works very late hours. But it doesn't seem like she's coming to get him. The boy knocks out and I have to take him to the Emoto clinic. Kiryu has a fight with foreigners because they think Emoto left their friend to die but he's fine. The boy is treated but the mom is nowhere to be seen. The mom is either working as a hostess which explains why he's alone at night or the mom just left him. If she is working and leaving him alone, why why not just have him stay home so that he doesn't catch a cold or get kidnapped? And I thought of the mom leaving him because I never saw her. Maybe she thought the solution of taking care and feeding her son was to leave him, but Kiryu saved the boy's life. The crane game wanted me to get prizes for Sasaki because he sucks at it and really wants certain prizes for his kid. And since I already like playing the mini game, this was an easy and fun sub story. He has a run in with a Yakuza member and then after beating him, Sasaki gives a locker key. But I don't care about that. I was able to help a father get prizes for his kid, which is all that really matters. Kiryu pretends to be Kenji, whose father is looking for him and Kiryu plays along with it, meets Tatsu who's currently taking care of the old man named Jin, and Kiryu has to deal with some homeless hunters who go around and beat on homeless people because they have nothing else better to do I guess. After this, Tatsu knows that Kiryu isn't Kenji and tells what's going on. Kenji was a medic for the war and he hasn't come back yet. Jin is still waiting for Kenji to come back home but probably knows that he died and when he saw Kiryu who looks like Kenji, he thought his son came back. Kiryu pretending to be him gave Jin one last moment to spend time with his son. What started from a mystique and lying turned into a real sad story. Sub stories number 30 to 33 revolve around an apprentice named Kano who really wants to be a Yakuza. The first thing he does is challenge a fight to Kiryu and gets his ass kicked and then wants Kiryu to train him to become a Yakuza and all of these sub stories is just him failing miserably at being one. The last one is a reality check where Kano was forced to draw out Kiryu so that other Yakuza members can beat him. Kano after this finally realizes that he's not cut out for the Yakuza life lifestyle and rather than putting his life in danger, Kiryu decides to save it and tells him to get out.
The cell phone plan is a good mystery. Kiryu comes across a dead body and sees two other guys freak out from it. A cell phone rings from the dead body and of course Kiryu picks it up. It leads to locker keys where he finds a dagger and the caller wants Kiryu to kill a certain someone and that person is Kiryu himself. Kiryu just so happens to find the assassin who was hired to kill him. A Tojo clan member hired him to kill Kiryu but the phone guy doesn't know the details. Kiryu is still left wondering. Love that it starts out as a mystery and still ends as a mystery. Memories of the Bubble is just a callback to Yakuza 0. There's an actress named Aya and she has a upcoming role where she's dancing in a disco club and wants to know what it was like dancing during the 80s and Kiryu just so happens to have lived through the decade and tells her about how the economy was great, everyone was throwing money around as if it was nothing and this honestly just made me want to go back and play Yakuza 0. Kiryu tells her all that she needs to know and dances in the club as if it was the 80s again and catches the eye of a director who's also looking for someone to play in his next project called Disco Queen of Love and Aya is perfect for the role. As a sub story, it wasn't all too important but because it was basically a love letter to Yakuza 0, I loved it. Behind the assassin gives backstory to the inmate that attacked Kiryu when he was in prison. Kiryu meets him again of course, both fight and the inmate wants to move on from the Yakuza stuff entirely. After going through what feels like unnecessary fighting, it turns out the inmate was a pawn sent in by Chairman Sarah. Sarah wanted to keep Kiryu safe so what better way than having him beat an inmate or multiple inmates to prove that no one should be messing with Kiryu and this made Kiryu's prison time so much easier. He could have been fighting an inmate or a bunch multiple times a day so in retrospect, it made the prison scenes mean a a lot more. And then the Amon fight which wasn't too bad. I failed a couple of times because I was too impatient so as long as I was spamming a bunch of heat moves at the beginning and then waited for the right moment to do tiger drop during his last date then it was fine. I love that it breaks a fourth wall when Joe asks if we know him and both characters just look at us and Kiri talks about fighting the same guy about 20 years ago. It doesn't go into who Joe is and I don't care. I see him as a final boss for completing all the sub stories so I don't need to know why he wants to fight Kiryu or why he even shows up in every game. Just want to beat him get a trophy and then move on. Mm -hmm. Majima Everywhere is essentially the Mr. Shakedown mechanic from Yakuza 0. The only difference is that rather than getting a lot of money, you earn dragon style moves when Majima is defeated. It's just fun seeing Majima pop up from a manhole or a building or even as a stripper. You can't escape for him. At the beginning, it was obviously a lot harder but once you learn Tiger Drop, it's game over for Majima. Defeating him 50 times wasn't an issue because he comes out as different styles from Zero. I was either facing the Thug, Slugger, Breaker, or Mad Dog style. There's even a surprise or force attacks by him, the stripper area, traffic cones, or just jumping down from a building. Playing 5 minigames with him was also another fun thing to do and all 5 were bowling because bowling is easy in most of the games. So Majima Everywhere is a great addition to this game. The minigames are usually the thing I look forward to the least because there's one or two minigames that I don't enjoy playing. Club Asia I didn't know was required for playing every single minigame and the minigame is just a strip show. I could change seats but I don't really see it as a minigame but I guess it is and it's okay. <laughs> Mesu King is a lesser version of the cat minigame in Zero. It's just paper, rock, scissors, and if I win that, then my characters get to attack. I don't like this one because it is 100% RNG based. There's not any way to actually be good in the game. I just had to be lucky. There were some stories tied to this, so I had to finish out the sub stories, which meant playing more of the minigame. However, the RNG doesn't seem as bad as it is in Yakuza Zero. <laughs> Pocket Circuit is my favorite minigame and sub story. The sub story is probably the longest one, which can be an issue, but it's not because I got to race with little carts and had rivals I had to beat for a good chunk of the sub stories. And I got to customize my cart with better parts in different colors. And honestly, this minigame can be its own game if there were more parts and content added to it. There were some tracks that I thought were difficult and looked up guides on, but even getting stuck on some races, I still have fun going through it. It's been 17 years since Kiryu and Pocket Circuit Fighter last met, and he has the sad news of having to leave this job to work at his parents tofu shop and now he needs to find a replacement and throughout this sub story both him and Kiryu try to find the next person to replace him and of course it goes back to those kids in Yakuza 0 they're now grown adults they have like lives now and have jobs after racing a whole bunch Takuma will be the one to replace pocket circuit fighter because he's the one that's always been thinking about this place as his main source of income and job and that's what makes him happy so pocket circuit fighter can move on
UFO Catcher is a staple minigame by this point in the series. I like it because it's a simple minigame that doesn't ask a lot. I only needed 15 prizes for the completion list. The Cabaret Club is listed as a minigame even though you don't actually play it like you do in Zero or Kiwami 2. It's tied to two sub stories that involve the hostesses and I don't really remember their sub stories so this one was forgettable and alright. The phone booth minigame is another simple one where I had to take 10 best shots. There are of course the casino minigames, poker, blackjack, baccarat, and roulette. I like all of them except roulette. Even though all of these are RNG minigames, I've never liked roulette and I think it's because of how long it takes for the roulette wheel to finish moving before it comes to a complete stop. I have to pray that the ball lands on the number I was betting on even though I know it's going to take a while to make some money and chips for it. Blackjack is my favorite because it's the easiest one for me to get into and quickly get chips for it. The gambling hall is where the Japanese gambling games are played. Chohan is a 50-50 betting game. You bet on either odd or even on where the dice will land on. And if I was right, then I got all the chips that the others are betting on. Silo is where I had to bet on what the dices were going to land on in this bowl that was being thrown by either me or the other players. That's what I took away from it. And like with the other gambling mini games, pray that I won with my bets. Koi Koi is a card game. And I still don't really know how to play the game or know what causes cards to have more points. Combine cards to get points and either call koi or don't if you want more points the only times when i called koi was when i wanted more than one point and as long as i had a multiplier to have at least 14 points then i didn't call koi and move on to the next round and then orjo kabu was the one where i had to get close or exactly nine points from my cards in order to beat the other players all of these gambling mini games will come back for pretty much every game which makes it easier when i eventually platinum the other games but also know that i'm gonna have to endure a bit of rng bs <laughs> darts is fun but so much better in the dragon engine games all the darts minigame before are a bit frustrating because you can't tell where your dart is going to land once i pull back to initiate me throwing the dart you have to aim with the tip of the dart and then when you throw lightly let go of the right stick to get a more accurate shot and thank god the requirements are only getting 10 hat tricks if i had to play the other types of dart minigame probably maybe a couple of hours on darts I enjoy playing pool. Most of the time, I just recklessly shoot the ball and hope another one makes it into the hole. I didn't have to beat the hardest difficulty or anything like that. I had to get three combination shots and three carom shots, which I don't know what it was. It's basically hitting two balls and getting both in the hole. I had to set them up constantly by getting a foul so that I can get two balls at the edge and then hit both at the same time. <laughs> For the batting center, I had to get 1,600 points for all the difficulties and hit two panels at the same time. Very straightforward, nothing too hard about it. Like with darts, the batting minigame gets better in the later games. There's a better indication on when I hit the ball to get a home run shot, which makes it a lot more fun to play. <laughs> Bowling has always been easy. Back when I was playing Yakuza 4 on the PS3, I remember looking up a video on how to get a strike all the time. And the method was to go to a corner and aim exactly diagonally and then go to the maximum power with no turning at all and you would get a strike. And this still works even in later games. There might be some instances where I didn't land a strike because of one pin and it's always one pin. I was only required to get 10 strikes and a total of 5 points in a split game. I never learned to play Shogi and I never will because there are videos on how to win a game without a take back. I only needed 5 take backs and then I just moved on. Would it benefit me to actually learn how to play Shogi? Yes, but I just don't want to. Mahjong is the reason why this game took forever to complete. The minigame itself I like, but it's the requirements that make me despise it. Getting a full straight seems impossible because of the RNG. There were even moments where I was close to getting it and then one other player got a sumo. Or if it wasn't that, it was just my tiles and I didn't get the right ones. Unless you're super lucky, then expect to play this game for about a full day or even longer. It took me a full day to get a full straight. And then the last minigame is probably the most well-known one because of the out of context clips that are on Twitter and just everywhere and it's mainly due to one song. 
everyone knows about this song, whether it was through her meme or playing the games, karaoke is always going to be part of the series. It's one of the many times where you can take a break from the story and cool down with a great song, or even when you decide to get off the game, you can close it out with a song. Getting 100 points for all the songs was easy enough, but I do like the Dragon Engine version better because you can see all the input that you need to press rather than waiting for the next line to pop up and not knowing whether or not it's fast or slow. <laughs> The climax battles is an extra mode that allows you to go through the boss fights in a boss rush or most of the time there's a certain objective that needs to be fulfilled within a certain amount of time. Most were easy to do even 10 where I had to play as Dante. Dante has very limited skill set, not very good. It's still doable. I did fail a couple of times but it was just a matter of trial and error and deciding who to take out first. The legend run was easy with all my stats and upgrades carrying over. All the bosses were easy to deal with, but there is one section where most people will probably have a lot of trouble with, which is the car section. Legend difficulty has a rule. If I were to die, that means I would have to restart from a last save. The way you get to that car section is by fighting through a bunch of dudes and then fighting Lao Ka Long, and then by this point, finally reaching the car section, and there is no save point between these fights, aside for the very beginning. So if I fail the car section, that would mean I would have to redo all those fights so what i did to prevent this was searching up a video and there were five videos that popped up and i used this one where this person was able to show when and where to shoot certain enemies watched the video a bunch of times to memorize it and then when it came time to the part i got through it in one try it would suck having to go back just to get to that one part Yakuza Kiwami first takes place in 1995. Kiryu still has the people who he considers family. Nishiki, who's a longtime friend he met at an orphanage. His father Kazuma, and another longtime friend Yumi, who he has a crush on but doesn't have the courage to tell her yet. It's a very normal day for all of them until Nishiki shoots and kills a Tojo Patriarch member for making moves on Yumi. Kiryu, being the great person that he is, tells both to run and he'll take the blame. Ten years pass by, and now it's 2005, where things are different. And when he gets back out, 10 billion yen has gone missing from the Tojo clan. Kiryu has to catch up on what's been going on since 1995 and is in the middle of the 10 billion yen situation. Some of the notable people that are looking for the money are Shimano, Lao Kao Long, who has a very annoying boss fight. Every time he switches his weapons, he probably has armor, and I'll have to wait until he's done attacking, which is why Tiger Drop is your best friend for most of the boss fights. Jingu is the guy that's been stealing money from the clan to make his own income and now wants to take back that money that he originally stole. His boss fight is also not the most fun. If you don't know what you're doing, then good luck. Hopefully you have a ton of health, dodge as many bullets as you can because two MIA agents also show up and have guns and it's just so much fun trying to avoid getting shot. And then there are other people and groups that are looking for the money, but I don't care about them, except for Manjima. He's looking for the money, but what he's really after is Kiryu. Along with the Manjima Everywhere mechanic, he finds any chance to have a one-on-one -on -one time with Kiryu, even though it feels redundant. I was already fighting him a bunch of times, and then there's the story-related fights, but I also can't say no to Manjima. He doesn't play any major role in the story, he's there to inconvenience Kiryu. Sierra, Kazuma, and Yumi were the ones who stole the money because they have found out about Jengu stealing it and rather than being out in the open, all three just sort of went away and disappeared for a while. <laughs> Haruka is also in the same position as Kiryu. She's in the middle of the 10 billion yen and all she wants to do is find her mother. So Kiryu helps her with that while also slowly becoming her father because apparently her father is Jengu and he just doesn't care about her at all. And her mother turns out to be Yumi so it all works out with Kiryu looking for her as well. And Haruka is the reason why Kiryu decides to keep on living after the events of this game. <laughs> Dante is a former cop who's looking for Chairman Sira, and just like with Haruka, becomes more of a friend and eventually a family member. Dante was banned from the force after investigating a detective and found out that he was exchanging info for bribes. Dante lost all respect for not only that detective but the entire force and now does solo investigations. He's the one to also convince Kiryu decides to stay with Haruka because he could rebuild an entirely new family just with him and her. He 
has changed a lot since Kiryu went to prison. He seems to have made it to the top of the Tojo clan. Doesn't really help Kiryu, gives him these dirty ass looks. While Kiryu was in prison, you would think Nishiki would be fine, but things just got worse for him. He had to live with the fact that Kiryu took the blame and now Tojo clan members don't see him in a good light and probably won't be able to be part of it anymore. He can't keep his men in line because they don't respect him and everyone keeps making comparisons of him to Kiryu and making him feel useless and inferior to Kiryu. His sister died and the doctor that needed 30 million yen completely lied to him. He has no one to go to and all of these things just keep happening until he breaks. The one guy that was giving him no respect pays the price and Nishiki decides to become his own man and get out from Kiryu's shadow. And he truly became his own man at the end. Rather than let Kiryu save him again, Nishiki sacrifices himself in order to pay back for the 10 years Kiryu spent in prison and be the one to stop Jingu, causing an explosion at the top of the Millennium Tower. Nishiki finally felt that he was useful at that moment. Kiryu lost everyone he considered family. Kazama got shot and despite telling him that he killed his biological parents, Kiryu doesn't care because Kazama filled that void of being his father. Yumi died because of Jingu. He was able to finally get with her and with Haruka being her daughter, it would have been the perfect family to lead another life but it was cut short. And then losing Nishiki, seeing him change and being able to have him back at the end just for a bit and then he had to go and self-sacrifice. Kiryu has no reason to live anymore but with the influence from Date, Haruka would be his way out from the Yakuza life. He does doesn't want to be the chairman anymore and realizes that it's gonna be a lot safer getting out and starting a new life with Haruka. 